Welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Judith. I'm Head of Government Relations and Education and Chair of the British Fashion Council, Colleges Council. Uh, welcome to this session. Apologies for those of you who are on the previous session. You're going to hear the same introduction that I made last time. It will start to be a bit repetitive, but um, I really did want to just highlight um, Graduate Preview Day. Um, each year, Graduate Preview allows industry professionals to access the portfolios from the graduating fashion talent emerging from our amazing colleges um, and it also fosters the relationship between educators, graduates and the fashion industry. Um, I encourage you all to go on to the Graduate Preview website. Um, it features the top um, portfolios from our graduates um, this year and it's got some incredible work on there that's, that's worth looking at and we'll put the link into the chat. Um, as well as profiling the top talent to industry and beyond, we've been running a series of events that support graduating uh, students with tips and knowledge about how to make those first steps into the industry. And we were literally just discussing how important and more important than ever um, um, this year. Whether it's insights into getting your first job or the kind of need to know advice um, about setting up a fashion business, we're giving you the chance to hear from the, some of the top people in the industry on the do's and don'ts of entering the world of work. So um, now I would like to, without further ado, introduce Matty Boven, designer and founder and friend of the BFC, um, who's in conversation with Mandy Leonard, who's a brand strategist, fashion consultant and founder of Mandy's Basement. Um, and they're going to be in discussion about what to, to, to do to start your own brand. So I'm really, I'm going to hand over to Mandy and Matty to lead um, the conversation. This is an interactive session. We welcome your questions, which will, if you can put them in the chat. And what we'd like to do at about half past 12 is to start a kind of interactive session and invite you to come on uh, camera and ask your questions to Mandy and Matty. So do put your questions in the chat so that we have those ready for that session at the end. So if everything's okay, Mandy, Matty, I'm going to hand over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, thank you. Hi, so Matty, this is fun. It is. <laughs> so um, I first met you actually when I went to the viewing um, of the St Martin graduate collections in the Granary building. I think Mel, our mutual friend, introduced us. Yeah. And um, it's been this organic relationship, hasn't it? And it has, yeah. It's and um, obviously you're in the glow of winning the international Walmart prize. Yeah, it's crazy. It's uh, been a it's been a <laughs> hell of a eighteen months, I think, hasn't it for everyone? But um, yeah, it's a nice it's nice to have this kind of exciting buzz still, even though I'm in all the way up in York. <laughs> so obviously, a lot of the graduates watching, they you know, it's it's been this kind of you know, they haven't really had much human interaction. A lot of people might have been isolated. And, and, you know, I think it's interesting for them to appreciate that actually people like us feel isolated and have the same same issues. So how, you know, it would be good for you to share how you coped, particularly with launching your new unisex label, Bovan. Yeah, yeah, totally. Well, I mean, obviously last year, it, everything kind of went up into the air for everyone, including all of us in the industry. You know, we were like, we didn't, we knew shows were not really going to happen the way they'd ever happened before. And all the schedules and everything went out the window and you know it was um kind of everyone thing ground to a weird halt really so my coping mechanism has always been to channel creativity and basically just to make things and to be able to you know physically do stuff so i decided to start to sort of paint onto t-shirts and sort of cut up sweatshirt fabric and start screen printing in the you know in my studio and start painting on top of stuff and it ended up being quite productive but it was it was a quite long period of time you know and i was on my own in the studio just kind of I have to do something that's the way I cope and that's my advice to a lot of people has been to just try and even if it's to learn a new skill in a creative way even if you might not think it's for you like if it's crochet or knit or you know drawing or something it's just such a nice thing to get off your phone and get off your laptop I mean I know I for one was everyone was glued to the news you know myself included we were all reading updates all the time and it was very intense in that way so I think it was really important for me to kind of switch off for a bit every day and just be able to produce something and that ended up being uh stuff for my east store last year yeah with the boven diffusion line which was just more fun and a bit more free and a bit more kind of it was just kind of a play on t-shirts sweatshirts and all the kind of things that i wear every day so you know i was, guess it was kind of made sense for me to explore that element 
And I think you're, it, it kind of introduced your work to a wider audience because there are some kind of low price points. There's T-shirts. I myself was a customer um, and it's exclusive to your eShop and it's all unisex. So, and yeah. I know there, there's a lot of one-off pieces as well because it's very important for you to craft um, yeah. and, and kind of work on, do handiwork. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I think it when it was very in tune with your sustainability ethos to actually find like end of line yarns and things yeah. like that lying around the studio and make these amazing like hats or <laughs> scarves, which someone who buys them on your website, they're one offs. Totally. Yeah. And I think I always like to put myself in the role of the customer or the consumer. And I like to think, OK, you know, is this interesting enough? And yeah, you know, that's important for me to ask that question. You know, is this, you know, everything I make is in limited numbers. You know, it's all very uh, special in that way and I think that's important especially now more than ever to put things out into the world that are interesting different you know and limited you know you won't see many people wearing any of this stuff because it's it's important for everything to be slightly different and you know I think it's people resonate with that I think and I, I you know I think now more than ever the industry's asking questions where stuff's from how it's made you know what's it made from what's its lifespan so it's something I've always been interested in anyway so it makes sense for me to try and communicate that more with people I think I've worked with a lot of graduate designers over the years and um, one of the things that I think is really important is to kind of identify who you are as a designer, you know, what are you, what is your signature as it were, and I think you were lucky because you specialised in knit at St Martin's and that's almost like the underpinning of everything you do. But where did the sustainability aspect come in? Because it's obviously very at the moment. And someone like me, when everyone was starting to say, oh, I'm going to be sustainable, I kind of thought, are you really, though? Whereas yeah. you seem to have always had this kind of, you know, belief in, in the resourcefulness of being sustainable. Yeah, well, well, I think it always came from in the UK, even as a student, it was very difficult to source things that you could get again. So that's quite a basic thing for putting things in, into production, you know. So you can get quite a lot of yarns that are one-off. You can get a lot of Roland fabrics that are one-off. A lot of the shops in London and actually some shops in, uh, there's a shop I go to near Bradford and Shipley that I always went to was just basically remnants, you know, end of line fabric. And I always loved it. And I was like, it's a shame you can't, you know, you can maybe get 10 meters. So I always, in the back of my head was always trying to question, is there a way I could utilize these things, you know, alongside say um, a print from Liberty with something else dead stock, you know, that I could then, communicate to people there's like 10 of these or there's like 15 of these you know or there's five of these um but because in the UK it's, you know it's very difficult as a student to source anything so I was always kind of questioning well maybe how could I put this into a production or into a wider audience but actually I'm lucky it kind of all came together when I started saying you know everything's slightly different and I think people uh, really enjoy that aspect and it's also good to try and communicate to the younger generations that this is a way you can actually go forward and you know, you're using stuff that no one else can get any real use from. And you're also being able to produce uh, in your own capacity. And everything actually is really interesting. You know, I like to think, you know, in the future, will these garments are sort of floating around. Do I think they're interesting? Do I think they're saying something? Yeah, I do. You know, I think they, I think it's the sort of thing you'd find in the future and be like, wow, you know, how is this made? Or what, what is it? You know, you know, I think it's just, it adds a layer of narrative and sort of history almost into them, I think. I think you were very much a lone, a lone voice about this kind of limited output. And I think, you know, when you enter the industry, when you've graduated, you feel this pressure to almost like, this is a collection, this is a top, it goes with a the bottom, these are the accessories, I've done a coat. Um, and and I, and I think, you know, it must, have, it, it must have been quite affirming to you that during the pandemic, a lot of the journalists, fashion journalists that we know, were starting to write about how how the way that you operate actually reflects how businesses should go now. So it's not about expanding and the biggest output and, and what have you. So actually lovingly crafting things can be commercial. And yeah. I think that winning the Walmart prize, a, prize, a recognized you know, body, um, recognizing those kind of facets of your business, it must feel really like empowering right now for you compared to let's say how you felt a year ago. Yeah, totally. I mean, of course, I everyone, you have to always question what you're doing. You know, that's kind of part of, I guess, growing. And also, like I said before, it's important to me that I put things out there that I believe in. So definitely winning this is, I mean, I'm still quite shocked, you know, it's, it's a new thing, but it's, it's a great validation of them saying, 
what you're doing is totally valid. And actually also they, you know, the response was really, um, they loved the narrative, their creativity, they loved the kind of locality of it, you know, working with local people. And I think that's great that kind of the world as, as a whole gets to hear that validation and think, okay, you know, but I think the past 18 months in that respect have been, have changed the way a lot of, but even, you know, bigger brands in London are thinking of the way that they, the way they create, the way they show, you know, even the designers there are questioning stuff a lot more. I think the, I think that's actually one of the good things to come out of the pandemic is that people had to stop for a minute, you know, and it has reset things a lot. And um, I think for the younger generation coming through, that's actually really positive because now is a time that you can actually, you know, hopefully grasp this and say, okay, I'm doing this and I want to do this, you know, and I believe in it. You know, that's one of the main things really, I think. I think what I find really fun about working with you um, in, in, in my role of kind of seeing how, what, what I can pin, let's say, press on and what, what we can keep um, releasing to the world um, in, in media terms is that you've got all these kind of fun little sidelines as well. So as much as we want to promote the fact that you won prizes, we want to promote the fact that the BFC has sorted, have again supported you with a new anniversary for your show in September. Um, you also um, release a zine, um, you release drops on your website of the Boven label. Um, and, you know, I, I, in my role as kind of working with you, I find that I spend as much time promoting your zine as I do when you re release a new collection. And I think that in that respect, it's a PR's dream because there's lots of these kind of fun, creative elements that you can put out um, there to people and yeah. they kind of respond as much to a zine yeah. as they would to the fact that you've just released a new film um, or you've just done your show and this is the lookbook images. Right. So um, do, you, do you feel that, you know, when you're in your studio and you have Greg and assistants there, um, do you feel that it's a fun vacation that you've chosen? Yeah, yeah, totally. I mean, every day I do feel really lucky that I get to do this as, you know, as my job because it's what I really love doing. But it, with the zines and stuff, it's kind of more just like almost like a different challenge because I know I can kind of do anything. So it's quite nice to pinpoint something, you know, and I also, you know, like I say, most of the days I do wear t-shirts, you know, I wear these sort of clothes. So it's kind of, it's interesting for me to try and work out how can I put a spin on this? How can I make, how can I put something out there that's interesting, you know, in, in an e-shop terms, you know, in kind of a diffusion line terms, that's not just soulless, you know, soulless pieces there, you know, it's something I believe in. And it's also a different creative element. It's kind of like I get to, you know, I'm, I'm releasing this uh, next month, we're releasing the zine and the t-shirts and stuff online, but it's not like we have to do it, I just enjoy the challenge, it's something very different from a show, you know, I wouldn't put these in a show in that respect, they're kind of different beings, and the zine's kind of, it's more like, everything for me is a bit of an experiment, so it's like, okay, let's see what we can do this time to make it interesting, you know, from whether how we print it, how it's bound, you know, who's contributing, how we're trying to get people to work with it, you know, it's just, um, we don't have to do it as such it's just something I really enjoy doing because it's like a different creative challenge really I think in that respect and it's always nice to do it in between shows because it's kind of a bit of a creative release for me quickly after a show to kind of do it and you know this one I was tie-dyeing all the stuff at the start and then I was all screen printing you know it had a lot of different layers that were kind of just basically experiments and you know fun and trying to work out if we can use it you know in the next season you know techniques are always moving so I just enjoy the creative side and the challenge really. Yeah. I know that when you graduated um, you did get some work experience yeah. um, so there was some kind of organic um, things that just happened like a natural progressions but then there was a point when I think you you were serious about doing your own label and you were you know you were lucky enough to be approached by Fashion East and and that's when I think we started working 2016 together uh, but you know let's say after Fashion East when it was that stage of have you done line sheets yep. you know what's the cost price yeah sorry what, what do you mean a buyer what, what do you do how do you find a buyer it, was that a bit of a culture shock to suddenly find yourself having to deal with like thinking about things like production and sourcing and yeah. Yeah, yeah, to totally. But I kind of enjoyed at the start the element. But I also, you know, I did always say from the start to the, you know, to everyone involved, whether it was showrooms, fashionistas, everyone, I said, you know, this is super limited. I can't make a huge output of stuff, you know, and so everyone was pretty okay with that. But again, like you said, it wasn't really the norm then at all. You know, you kind of were meant to 
get you know everyone wanted you to get sales for big sales so you could support yourself you know I understand that but a lot of the stuff you know I was crocheting the pieces by hand at that point you know and I love that kind of I love that I did that and I still work on stuff like that now but it was much more kind of kitchen sink craft in that way and it was we did communicate that I think to the buyers and stuff but you know I had to learn yeah I had to it would have been interesting to you know uh, even uh, when I was studying we didn't discuss those sort of elements so it was interesting to kind of explore that it was, a, it was a real thing you know it was like you were actually doing it on the job sort of thing in that respect but I remember I got some templates from Fashion East and stuff you know people were very helpful it was just kind of it's tricky because I'd sourced a lot of the stuff as dead stock and roll ends you know and some fabric from just a fabric shop in York you know it was kind of it was kind of like that then. and then I think it was quite overwhelming but the season after that I actually used even more dead stock so obviously it had an impact I enjoyed because you know I just wanted to use stuff that I had around me you know and sourcing stuff you couldn't get again I think it's more exciting really but you know I still have yarns that I've had since I was 16 that I still use in pieces you know so for me it's a very like special circular thing you know I keep everything pretty much <laughs> and um part of the creative is all the visual elements so for example when you create a lookbook I can't stand that word it feels so old-fashioned now but when you release a new collection whether you do it digitally or whether you do it in a, like a physical show you you provide up full-length shots of models um and people like vogue.com um, they list them and actually a lot of the big global stylists in the music industry and actors and TV, they will actually pour over those lookbook images. Um, but, you know, you were quite daring because um, for the autumn winter 2021 season, you actually had some cropped images. Yeah. Um, the backdrop was incredible. You had an artist create that. Um, you even had the musician <laughs> involved in the whole scenario. So, you know, um, I do think that, you know, for the graduates watching, it's very important, isn't it, to kind of consider all these creative solutions and, and add visual texture to everything that you do. Even like when you send a lookbook to a buyer, it's not just a sketch of a, of a silhouette with a price. You've got to make it um, visually arresting, haven't you? Yeah, totally. Even if like, I think that, you know, this season we just shot the garments on like a sequin backdrop for the line sheet, you know, just so they kind of looked more interesting and had a nicer light around them. But for the lookbook itself, I mean, it's actually, it was more just happenstance because of COVID, you know, I was very wary about even shooting real models, you know, we were going to shoot in New York because we weren't really advised to travel anywhere. No one was really doing anything. So it was quite difficult. But, you know, um, I, I shot it on iPhone. You know, we did the backdrops with a friend of mine who painted them. I said, can I use these as backdrops? I got them blown up. It was very, I think it's important to tell, especially the guys watching today, the students and everyone, because it was me shooting, doing the hair and makeup, you know, styling. It was very, very small. It was very like, it, it might look, they look quite strong as images is what, what I wanted, but you know, I just bought a photography light, a wind machine, like it was, it was very um, DIY, which I think is actually an important testament of the times now because we kind of didn't even know what was happening. It was like, okay, let's just try and shoot it in York. Let's set up a backdrop. You know, we booked a church hall. It was very, it, it, they look like completely out of this world in a way, the images, but that's what I wanted. But the reality was they were grounded in a very normal experience, you know? Um, but I always like to think visually. I mean, I think that's just important in fashion. Yeah. It's a visual term, you know? I think those graduates watching, um, if they want to go onto your website, mattabobin.com afterwards, they can have a look at the images that we're talking about. But I do think that, those backdrop drop images of the winter collection, they really solidify the narrative, which was um, an O to the C, and it was called Odyssey. Um, and, and there was a very strong underpinning, you know, like the, um, the kind of elements of the design, the very, very strong narrative. I think students, I think graduates do know now that they have to have a narrative or meaning. They can't just design something for the sake of it. But, you know, how how do you feel? Because you've graduated from St. Martin's, which is an incredibly creative experience yeah. um, for, for students when they graduate. But, you know, how prepared did you feel to actually go into the real world? Because this, this must be a real issue for so many people that are listening. Yeah, yeah, totally. And I think it's a lot of the schools, you know, it's a big culture shock. Um, I felt confident creatively you know I knew I had a good skill I knew how to use it I knew that I kind of liked the whole image of fashion you know I like the styling I like the hair and makeup yeah. I like the clothes I wasn't 
like even for my MA, it was super experimental, you know, so it was never, we never really discussed how I could take it commercially. Now I did make all my own clothes at the time. So I kind of understood how to make ready to wear in that way, but I'd never had, the, I'd never sort of mashed it together in that way, which could have been, I think, more interesting. I think it was particularly difficult time for, you know, there was transition on the course I was studying definitely at the time. Um, but I think, I think in a way I'm quite happy I learned on the ground running because I just had to, you know, I really had to just deal with it and sort of get on with it. But it was a big culture shock, you know, trying to sell, understanding pricing, understanding talking to people, you know, I'm not, I'm reasonably good at communication, but I didn't know how to really formally speak to people. And, you know, so it's all been a learning process in that respect. You know, and I didn't really know how PR worked. I didn't really know how, you know, it, it's a big industry, but I think at the time, especially there wasn't really, Instagram was just happening. You know, the platforms of understanding what, who did what and how was a little bit more old school. So it was a bit more exclusive, I think, than the industry, a bit more closed off in a way. It was kind of harder to understand that how the different sides worked. But, you know, I remember, lending stuff out to a magazine afterwards I had no you know it was just completely new experience you know but I guess I you know I, learned, I picked up pretty quickly but yeah it was um, and, and the dreaded pro forma yes totally well, I remember yeah <laughs> I remember trying to I remember taking some looks when I was on the MA into I took them to a FedEx depot in the boxes and had no idea they were like you can't you can't do it like this you have to book it and so, you know, I'd never booked a FedEx I had no idea how it worked and I carried all the stuff on the bus in the middle of North London in the middle of nowhere you know and I remember just being like oh, like kind of horrified I, it's just one of those moments where I was like I you know I do not know how to do with FedEx you know I just didn't know and so it was interesting I learned a lot on the on the go as they say but it's good to challenge yourself isn't it because I think one of my hang-ups when I started out in my marketing and PR career is you always think oh God, it's not very professional, am I being perfect? That seemed to be my hang up. Mm. And I think, um, you know, you've got to really challenge yourself, haven't you? Because I find that if a client um, needs me to do something that's a bit out of my comfort zone, I actually relish that because it's making me research an area that I wasn't familiar with and it's it just expands your skill set. Do you ever feel, because I, I, I get the impression working with you very closely that that you challenge yourself. And I think that's a really good thing. So you're get, almost getting all your mistakes out early and you're learning on, yeah, the, on the hoof. T totally. And I think actually that's really important advice for everyone who's graduating and anyone who's, you know, in that position and even studying still, that to challenge yourself is something, I, it can be really difficult to actually face that. But it's important in every aspect, even if it's small, you know, small elements of design or, you know, speaking to putting yourself out there and trying to talk to people, you know, sending emails you might not normally send or trying to approach people through Instagram even these days, all that works. You know, I work with people that have done that with me. You know, I think it's it's difficult. I, I think it's important, though, to every day kind of say, right, OK, I'm you know, I'm going to try and learn something. or I'm going to try and push myself. I mean, because otherwise you, you end up being stagnated, I think. And so I think it's more important than ever now. And with the Internet, I think, you know, you can just send a message. If you don't get a reply, you don't get a reply. You know, I you know, I know how it works. So I think it's important for people to push themselves definitely but even out of your comfort zone with actual design and you know making the stuff you know it's now more than ever everyone's kind of where you can see all the graduates coming through everyone's like doing more intense stuff than ever and I think that's because they're pushing themselves in these kind of extreme situations of being in lockdown and not having access to all the correct equipment and stuff so I think in every sense it's important advice and hopefully people listen and kind of think okay I'm going to apply that to everything I do because I, I think it's important. And then when these fashion competitions, there's Amdam, there's New Gen, there's just loads that the BFC do, which is amazing. Yeah. Um, but when you actually apply for these, people don't realize that it's actually a lot of work. It's not just filling out a form on, online. You know, you've got to really get in the zone and invest time and, and be respectful because if you want someone to give you money, you've got to kind of explain what, what you need it for. Um, but it, it is important, isn't it, for people like you? It's brilliant that so many of these fashion prizes and sponsorships like Fashion East exist, um, because when you go through that experience, you're learning. And also I've noticed um, with the BFC and with Fashion East, um, once you've actually earned a prize or won a prize or been part of a system like New Gen, the relationship doesn't stop there. They, they, you can always turn around to them. I mean, the number of times I get emails from the BFC saying, um, oh, we wanted to have a business catch up with Matty. It's so brilliant, isn't it, that yes. students do have these. So I think it's very important for people like you to get in the system. Yeah, yeah, totally. It's also um, one of the main things I think is really is they take a chance. You know, they're taking a chance on 
me on other designers a fashionista took a chance you know everyone it, it's really those chances are so important you know I was lucky enough to get the BFC scholarship when I was on the MA and again if I hadn't got that I don't know if I'd be sitting here today you know it, they're quite important that you know it's very important things what they do all these scholarships you know not everyone who supplies scholarships to the schools I think is amazing because it, it can really be that do you take the do you do the course or do you not do the course you know so it's the same with fashion and new gen you know without that it, it support is vital really for young people coming through and i think and also even if you don't get it the first time when you apply it's great to do that application process and learn how it is because you know i we know how it's very um they ask a lot of questions you know so it's good to kind of understand and even look at the form you know as young people as you everyone watching hopefully you know it's kind of aspirations of you know doing their own label or you know working with people like me it's kind of just good to understand how these things work because it's it's uh, it's an intense process but like you say you know it's they're giving you a kind of lifeline really so it's I, I think that you know again it's like getting out the comfort zone because when you apply for a, um, a fashion competition I think the first thing that a designer or a graduate thinks is oh my god I won't get it I'm not I'm not good enough you know I think that's a normal knee jerk to someone who hasn't has experience you know, out there in the wide world, have just graduated. Oh, I'm not good enough. I won't get it. Yeah. And I think, you know, I feel that's very defeatist. Um, but also, I think that, you know, applying for um, a competition or a graduate support, or even reaching out. I'm such a big believer in reaching out. Okay. All the best relationships are spawned from actually getting in. People get in touch with you on social media. The number of times. I, I get an email from someone saying, oh, Matty and I have been chatting on Instagram. Yeah. It says yeah. I should contact you. And I'm thinking, oh, here we go again. <laughs> you've almost like in that virtual world, you've built a relationship with somebody and you know you want to work with them instinctively yeah. or the way in which they've they've emailed you has, has touched something where you're engaging with them. And it's brilliant. Yeah, totally. I, remember that, I remember that when Nicola Formachetti was at Dazed and Confused in the 2000s, yeah. Um, he used to decide who was going to work with by their, by their um, what was it called? Um, it was a social media of the time. I can't remember what it was called, but he'd look at their page. He didn't want to look at CVs. Wow. And I think, I think, you know, like now, at the way that when people get in touch with me, I look at their Instagram page yeah. and within like three seconds, I can, I can assess whether this is an interesting proposition. It's yeah. so brilliant to have that portal now. So in a way, would you say that graduate should actually be very serious about their social media well I think I think it needs to be a reflection of you you know so I think it really it's great to try and you know get across your personality there's no rules with it you know I think you can do whatever you want you can even use you know like people sometimes write in the kind of interesting fonts and stuff you know I quite like my copy what they're saying it all depends on the person it's kind of like if you're doing a portfolio you really have to just try and distill the essence of you as you know really what you like and what turns you on and what makes you you I think that should come across in everything you know so I think it's great that you can put, you know, you can even, it's almost like a kind of mix between a, a portfolio and a blog and all, you know, Instagram, you know, it's yeah. great to get all the kids doing all the makeup, you know, I love it all mixed together. That's what I love doing. And I like seeing a bit of um, kind of like an energy in it, you know, not so stiff sometimes, but it depends on the person totally. But I think it's, um, it's always interesting now that that's kind of opened up a different world. I think, I think that's important, you know, really that you can, kind of have a personal expression through the internet, I think. It makes sense to me. Clues, isn't it? It's clues. Yeah. But in, in my role working as a PR, you know, I, I did some research lately because I felt that there were all these amazing music industry stylists out there and I had to reach out and I wanted to get their emails. And actually, I would say that 70% of them just sent me their email when I asked them on Instagram, you know? So, yeah. so you've just got to reach out to people and be quite bold. The other point I wanted to, to make was that when we were talking about the fashion competitions and you not think you're ready, you've got to go through the process even before you're ready yeah. to actually become confident with the, with the world of these competitions. It's almost like practice for when you, when you really do a plan, you know you're ready. It's a bit yeah. like when you're going to drive. You, you know, I'll never drive. And then one lesson, you know, oh my God, I can drive. I know I can drive now. So I think, I think, you know, and also I think if anyone applies for these fashion competitions, it might not be one that they take, they take that seriously, almost like, oh, they're not going to pick me. But it's almost like, don't worry about that. Because when you apply for it, if they do pick you as a finalist, then you can worry about it. Then you can deal with that thing. You can't just think too far ahead. You've just got to, literally be totally. I would say reaching out reaching out reaching out look at before your last show when we were in lockdown and we started getting in touch with people for products you know socks shoes uh, 
you know, no one said no, did they? And we no. suddenly had all these incredible products and that gave us more confidence to maybe take it a step further and think, right, can we actually collaborate? Can we yes. talk about sponsorship? Um, and and, it, and it's, it's almost like practice, isn't it? You know, you're getting in touch with people, but you're getting ready for when you really do need yeah. these portals but but also you just you literally do never know you know you never know who's you know we don't even know if the email gets through sometimes you know but sometimes it does and even with young you know graduates and stuff now people are looking more than ever at ways they can kind of support people and you know they, they, they want to get people to kind of you know they want interesting content these brands so even if you think you're too small just try it they might be like great yeah you, it depends you know sometimes you just get through the net and also feedback in terms of the competitions and the grants and everything is really key and also with um, reaching out to people for items you know products but feedback's always so important to get because you think okay great maybe we didn't get it this time but let you know just interested to see people's thoughts you know and that's how you kind of you learn but you know i think as long as you've got a strong sense of identity you know just keep your own don't just keep your own identity clear when you're approaching people for items you know and just think okay what can i show them two pages that's me you know yeah i think hi everyone <laughs> You, you two are amazing, absolutely amazing. And thank you for the shout out on our initiatives. We've actually, um, our scholarships are open at the moment for applications. So for anyone on the call who wants to go on and do an MA, we've put the scholarships link um, in, in the chat. And I would, like you say, encourage anyone to apply. Do, do not let the application form be a barrier. If you've got any issues, just reach out to us. So in the spirit of reaching out, um, right, come on, everyone who's on the call, there must be questions to Matty and Mandy. Surely this is your opportunity to appear in front of them and to reach out and to, to, to have that, that question. Your, your relationship, I, I absolutely love. What, what, what's kind of made you your kind of trusted go-to person? I mean, Matty, what, what is it in, in Mandy that, that makes this relationship so unique? Because I think all designers need that, that, that collaborator, that, that person. What, what would you say that is? Well, with Mandy, I think she's always, um, I, I learned, I've learned over the period, but one of my biggest lessons I've learned is that actually to dream bigger in a way, you know, and to really just think, yeah. let's just ask for it, you know, and that was something I didn't really have before because, you know, I, was, I wasn't that mindset and it's been amazing to, you know, it's always like, why not? Let's just ask, you know, let's just, let's think, but it's so exciting, you know, Mandy's got such a great energy for things like that. And it's really important to have people like that because it's just, it's always like, everything's like, you know amped up and exciting and you know mandy understands my energy totally so it's kind of Brilliant. it's great you know she, but she'll just say to me why not let's try it you know let's we could do this for this we could do this you know it's really inspiring to have that because i'm a bit more realistic i'm a bit more kind of bogged down in details on you know and making stuff it's kind of great to have someone to it makes me you know makes me kind of think differently and i think that's really key for me it's like so exciting is that the answer you're expecting mandy <laughs> It is far really well, but I think what yeah. I really enjoy about working with Matty is that when I've worked with designers in the past, they've been very fully reliant on me. So I can almost like, dare I say, make them do what I want them to do um, and tell them what they need to be doing. Whereas I think with Matty, it's more of a mental relationship. I think that I really enjoy, because I've had the experience now, I really enjoy telling him what I think and, and, and emboldening him to make his own decisions. I think it's so important. That, that he is making his own decisions because yeah. you know he has he it's his name on that on that brand so he he has to have all these tools in his armory on how to cope with stuff so I also think that you know I've had a lot of guiding lights in my career you know people that are in front of you that you haven't recognized that actually bring good stuff to you and become mentors so I think that the graduates need to really identify these characters when they appear they need to be on the lookout yeah because these are people that are always going to bring goodness and they're people you can turn to and ask advice and everyone should have um, mentors in, yeah. in their personal armory. Cool. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So we've had a question from Ems. I'm hoping that they're here and we'll ask you live. Hello. <laughs> Ems, are you there? If Ems is indeed your name. <laughs> Hello. Oh, maybe are you having trouble on me? Hello, no, can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you yeah. now. Hello. Oh, this is all new. It's been such an experience yeah. just being. Um, I've got a question for Matty. Um, 
you recently worked with Hyatt Denim because I'm from Wales oh, and our tutor, our tutor works um, in Hyatt Denim as well. So how did that come about, that collaboration? Oh, great, well, that's a great question. Thank you for that. Yeah. Um, well, it's always been a passion of mine to try and work with people across the UK. I'm always trying to look for people, brands that I think have my sort of ethos and are interested in and are doing something totally like on their own on their own sort of um, pathway, you know. So I was kind of researching and then um, sort of just dropped them a message and said, you know, I'm interested in working, you know, with people on my next collection. And, you know, I was trying to find people, denim in the UK is quite hard to find people that manufacture. Yeah. So they were great. Yeah. And obviously it was in Wales. I know Wales was going through quite a few lockdowns because every time we catch up with them on Zoom, it'd be like, no, we've gone to like another lockdown, you know, it was really stressful time. So they did a really beautiful job and they were great actually to work for. So yeah, it was, um, it was so exciting. And, you know, it's very important to me to try and work with people across the UK, you know? So okay. I think- Sorry. Great, yeah, they were great and it was just great fun. It was a very difficult period. It was like the Christmas this past winter, I think was difficult for everyone. You know, it was a really tough, a really tough time for businesses and for, you know, everyone in general. So oh, it was great, yeah. Nice question, thank Sorry, you. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, thank you for your- Thank you, Ems. Thank well, it's been really interesting. Thank you. Oh, thanks. You're welcome. And congratulations to all of the Welsh people making it through to the finals yeah. of the European Cup. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> as, as someone with a husband who's Welsh, I felt important to that. <laughs> Thank it was you. only my first year um, in fashion, so you know, going to these has been great. Oh, oh we've cut her off. Oh dear. <laughs> Thanks, Em. So another question that that we've had, um, and I think probably for for Mandy and for Matt is. How, just how you gauge the audience demand or, or price your products when you're just starting out. What advice? I mean, that's, that's always one of the trickiest bits, isn't it? And I guess there's a habit to almost underprice. Um, so what would your advice be there? Matty, you want to? Yeah, of course. Um, so I, I usually, well, obviously you have to work out practical things like material, you know, then, because I do a lot of things, treatment in-house, you know, I have to work out time. Um, I, you know, it's also good to kind of, I like to think about like how much it's actually going to sell for, but to be honest, I really have to think of the time, the limited availability, the materials, the actual, you know, it takes a lot of elements to get them to the stage where they're ready to go out to production. But, um, you know, I try and do it as fairly as possible, but it's, it's tricky, but you can kind of just divide it up in time materials, you know, uh, think about who you want to sit with in the market those sort of price points but I, I do try and be as fair as and honest as possible really with myself and pricing and also what the garment is of course is very important so you know if it's a tank top it's different to a coat <laughs> <laughs> I think it's um important to actually you know look at different brands you know as your brand and you're deciding what you represent as a brand you know being able to say to somebody um Oh, I see myself sat alongside Fendi and, you know, other brands, you, you know, you need to place yourself. And in that respect, I think it's really good for people to go into shops and look at prices and look at composition of fabrics yeah. and just actually see the reality of the marketplace. And when you're in a shop to actually, I think that's one of the th first things I was taught in retail to always look at the label and the composition. Um, and and um, and all these designers, you know, there's certain shops where they might have an emerging section for emerging designers, but there's a stage, but there's but there's a lot of pigeonholing, and I think that's really difficult today. So, for example, Matty's label is is under the women's wear umbrella, but actually there's men's wear and there's and there's however you want to wear, um, regardless of, um, you know, sexual or binary or what, what have you. So, so I think there's no rules, you can make your own rules. But um, the, problem, the problem is that when you go to the stores, you're meeting the women's wear buyer, you're meeting the men's wear buyers. So I think Matt has been really lucky because he's been working with Natalie Kingham at Matches. And she is so in tune with who he is as a designer. It's almost like a collaboration. They work very collaboratively. So they, do, they do a lot of projects, but her sensibility is very, um, makes, it, make, makes a very fertile relationship. So it's almost like she's not just a buyer that sees Matty twice a year and buys the collection. It, it, it's so much more. And I think that a lot of buyers 
have that in their in their remit now. So there's yeah. lots lots of potential in these kind of relationships. Interesting. We have our next Ivan. Are you are you there? <laughs> Hello. Hello. Hi. How are you? It's been a while since we've seen each other. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm good. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Do you want to pose your question to Matty and Mandy? Yes. So, if you are a um, a current 2021 graduate and uh, you want to launch your own collections and uh, make your own work and sell that. Um, it's the best way to go about it, to go through initiatives such as uh, Fashion East and BFC Newgen, or are there uh, other instances where people have like just started on their own and made it in that way and just contacted PR just on their own and buyers as well? Um, and are there, I'm sorry, just like three questions in one, but are, are there more uh, initiatives like Fashion East and New Gen? Because those seem really great, but uh, as well, it's like, um, yeah. yeah. Well, I would, I would say, um, like Mandy was saying earlier, um, definitely apply for those initiatives because, you know, no matter what comes out of it, it's great experience. And then you'll be ready, you know, if you did have to apply again in the future. But also, if you don't necessarily get those things at first, what my advice would be is to kind of maybe expand upon my most recent graduate work, you know, set and maybe make some new looks inspired by that that are fresh. And I'd probably put them on my social media. You know, I'd take some really great shots of them, even if it was just myself or, you know, or on friends or, you know, think of the concept that you can maybe get some great images from that are strong. And then, you know, then you can gain attraction through that, hopefully with social media, because I think there's some things when people graduate, they get a bit stuck and a bit kind of like, I've made my collection, I'm kind of done. I think it's great to kind of push yourself out of that and think, right, I'm going to make six whole, you know, other looks or, you know, expand upon this one thing I thought was great because it's kind of, then when you're applying for stuff, you've always got kind of a great portfolio and like fresh work, you know, and it's good for people to see that, you know, you're doing it on your own no matter what, you know, so it's great to have this sort of documentation through Instagram, to, you know, TikTok, Twitter, to then be like, no, I did more looks this summer, you know, everything's fresh and developing and it shows you kind of really believe in your own work. I mean, I think it's, almost good to break that thing of when you graduate to just go straight into it and make other stuff even if it's just from stuff around your house stuff you've got left over stuff from friends customizing you know i think just try and do that and keep applying for stuff and if they show if you see if people see you're making work and you've got that passion and you you've got that kind of output you know you're able to make keep making stuff i think that's a really great skill to have but that's my advice from the sort of design perspective anyway <laughs> yeah yeah okay. makes sense uh um, modem online is very good um, and, and other kind of fashion um, portal websites because they will let you know about all these competitions as they come up um, and you know it's I don't know again the pandemic has has impacted on a lot of these competitions but they will be resuming again um, and I know that it's um, in Italy is, is another incredible one um, so so, but, but the other thing to, that I wanted to say was that when you apply for these competitions, you're actually putting yourself on, on radar because a lot of these competitions have got great people behind them. So when you, I, I, I'm on the Fashion East panel myself and when um, we get great talent come in, it might not be ready for Fashion East, but we're certainly keeping an eye on them, you know, and we're excited about when they will be ready. So you've got to put yourself on radar with people. That's, that's for sure. And by entering a competition, you are you are making yourself visible. That's, I can testify to that for those on the call. We we run a, even the shortlisting panels are all industry experts. So you're you're making your work visible. You're you're putting yourself out there. And certainly, we hope that the application process kind of organises your work in a helpful way. Obviously, we're sort of thinking about how the judges are looking at it, but but we're trying to be helpful in terms of of, of how you organise your work as well. So um, yeah. Okay, thanks, Ivan. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. <laughs> well, unfortunately, we're out of time. I mean, I, it, it's just like blowing me away how quickly the, this morning's gone and, and these sessions, you think 45 minutes and then they pass so quickly. 
Um, thank you, Mandy. Thank you, Matty, for the brilliant conversation. It's lovely to see your, your relationship in practice as well. Thank you so much. And um, to everyone on the call, um, we've put in the chat the next discussion, which is at one o'clock. Are you employment ready? Um, which if you feel you're not quite yet, then you will be after that session. So <laughs> encourage you to come along. We've also put in the, the link to scholarship applications and to the graduate preview day portfolios. Do please go and have a look at those. Um, and for all of those who are interested in our initiatives, I suggest you follow the BFC on social media because we put the announcements for all our applications. It tends to be in the new year time, sort of end of the year, new year. Um, but if you follow our social media, you'll see those announcements as well. So thank you both. Um, a sad goodbye. I hope to see you in real life very soon. <laughs> but thanks for your contribution. Speak to you soon. And thanks, everyone. See you at the next session. Thank, thank you. Everyone. Thanks. Bye. Bye.